Op 24 april 1957 gaf Joel de London Class 1957. We gaan luisteren naar spoor 2 van die bandopname. God Realized en One Power. Good evening. First, I would like to explain <clears throat> the function of these meditations because they are important not only in our classwork, but they are important in every activity of our human experience. If I were to come to this class and voice truth, which I could, without the benefit of meditation, every word that I would say to you would be something coming out of my memory, something coming out of what I have learned <coughs> in the past or read, or had unfolded, something that we might call yesterday's manna. Whereas, if I come here and meditate until the actual feeling of the presence of God is with me, then I'm no longer speaking out of myself, out of my mind, out of my memory or knowledge. I have become an instrument through which the Spirit can speak. And therefore, I may say things to you of which I myself had no knowledge when I say it. In other words, it can be some unfoldment of an entirely new nature to me. And as a matter of fact, that is exactly what has happened in the entire ten years of teaching the message of the infinite way. When I started, there was just the book, The Infinite Way. And uh, whatever of truth I knew was embodied in that book. When uh, the first few students came and asked for class, I had no idea of what kind of a class to conduct because it seemed that I had put everything in the book that should be there. But they said, we would like a class on scripture. Well, everything I know of scripture is in that book. I don't know anything else. No, they felt that there should be a class on scripture. And I agreed to it. But the week before the class was to begin, I spent hours every day and night in meditation turning to the Father for guidance. What do these students want? What is it that I'm supposed to give them? And through that meditation, I was led to open the Bible, and I opened to some part of the story of Moses. Well, I went back to the very beginning of Moses and read all the way through to see if I could... Uh, find what it was that I was to give. And I read all the way through Moses up to the Ten Commandments, up to and through the Ten Commandments, and instantly as I read the Ten Commandments it flashed in my mind, that's the law. 
That's the law. Everything up to this has been the law. But Christianity isn't the law. Through Jesus Christ came grace. Grace that is to supplant law. And so when we had our first class, that was our subject. That in our Hebrew state of consciousness, that is our human state of consciousness, we are under the law. But as we rise into our Christian nation, nature, we rise above the law into grace. And as you read the Old Testament now, you will see how thoroughly it is the law. And as you read the New Testament, you will see how thoroughly the Master came to take us above the law into grace. Well, when it came to the second week, I went through the same procedure, and this time when I opened the Bible, I opened to the uh, story of Ruth and Naomi. And so I read that through and prayed for guidance, and it came again. Ruth and Naomi are only names. There is no Ruth and there is no Naomi. We are Naomi. We are that person who left our spiritual estate to go down into materiality. We are the ones who have prospered materially. And we are the ones who have lost all of our material prosperity and found ourselves lost, our fortunes lost, our families lost, everything that the human world calls worthwhile lost. But if we reach enough degree of being lost, something inside of us says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I will never depart from you, whithersoever thou goest. I will go, and we know then uh, that Ruth really isn't a girl, a woman. Ruth is a symbolical story of the Christ. That spiritual impulse of which I spoke last night, which never leaves us, never forsakes us, but we, living in the world of men and women, living the life of material good, we neglect the Christ, and uh, in the uh, language of Scripture, of course, Ruth was the daughter-in-law, and uh, daughter-in-law of an alien people, the least of these. And in the life of the humans, Christ is the least of their lives. No matter how much homage they may pay to the man Jesus, and no matter how much respect they may have for the Savior, the Lord, or whatever name he has in consciousness, the Christ, the Spirit of God in you and in me, is really the least of all things until we are so completely down and out, to use one of our expressions, that we turn and uh, Say, why hast thou forsaken me? And the answer comes back, I have never forsaken thee. I, in the midst of thee, am mighty. As I was with Moses, so I am with thee. And so, each week, some passage of scripture was illumined, and at the end of a year, some of the girls who had taken notes gave them to me, and out of their notes came the book, Spiritual Interpretation of Scripture. And so you can see that the book, Spiritual Interpretation of Scripture, was never a book written by an author. It was the fruitage of meditation brought to light. 
Now every class that has ever been given in the infinite way since then has been conducted on the same principle. On the day of the class or the night before and all through the class, my meditation is I have nothing to give. The class isn't assembling to hear a man. They want truth. They want God. And they don't want to hear about God. They want to experience God. Let me be an instrument through which God may touch the individual consciousness. Now last night that happened in this room and uh, I have knowledge of its having happened, at least in one instance, whether in war or not, I do not know. So it is. It isn't that I have a message for you, for I haven't. Any of my messages of the past are to be found in the books and the tapes. The purpose of our being here is that you may experience the Christ, the very Spirit of God, that it may touch you and lift you above material sense into spiritual consciousness where you will apprehend the divine truth about yourself, about this universe, about your fellow man. Now. <clears throat> This principle is not an especial one given to me for teaching. This is a principle that applies to all men, women, children, anywhere on the face of the globe. And it concerns everyday life. Now you may accept the belief, if you wish, that you are a businessman or a professional man or woman, or that you are a housewife. And if you do, you sadly limit yourself. If you understand that you are an instrument through which God lives, you will awaken each day and turn to the Father within as I turn for this class, so you turn for your day and then see how God will live its life through you and as you, and it may completely change your life. Actually, we were never meant to be human beings. We were never meant to be mortals. Our true function is to be the child of God, the offspring of spirit. We are told in scripture that the heavens declare God's grace. The heavens declare him. The earth shows forth his handiwork. How much more do you think we are intended to show forth the mind and soul and spirit and body of God? That is our original purpose. That was the original purpose of creation, not to send mortals into the world to battle each other, not to send humans into the world to slaughter animals and animals to slaughter other animals. That wasn't the purpose of creation. Nobody created one people to conquer another people or one color to conquer and dominate another color. Those are the inventions of man. True being is that there is neither Greek nor Jew bond nor free. We are all one in Christ Jesus, and that is our spiritual identity. That is the spiritual truth of our being. Now, 
we wondered from that, and the Bible tells us in what manner we wondered. The secret is given in Genesis, but it has been lost for several thousands of years. It is only now being restored, and it will take many centuries before the world as a world accepts it. But any individual or group of individuals with sufficient spiritual vision may at this very moment accept it for themselves and begin to demonstrate it. And in proportion as they demonstrate it, they will find the truth of what I'm telling you, that we were never created to be mortals and we do not have to remain such. Now the secret of the fall of man is this, the acceptance of good and evil. You and I, as we sit here now, each in some degree or other, some more, some less, are accepting the two powers, good and evil. To some things we say you are good, to some things we say you are evil. To some people we say you are good, to some we say you are evil. To some conditions we say you are good, and others we say you are evil. Now, when uh, we understand why this is not true, why there is no thing or person good and no thing or person evil, we can begin to lift ourselves out of mortality and into a state of life more nearly approximating our spiritual sonship. Now I illustrate it first <clears throat> as uh, has been done and probably you are aware of this in other classes through the tapes with this hand. I say to you that this hand is neither a good hand nor an evil hand. I say to you that this hand cannot give and it cannot withhold. If there is any giving, I am giving. If there is any withholding, I am withholding. I say to you that this hand cannot pet and it cannot punch. If there is any petting, I'm doing it. The hand is only an instrument. If there is any punching, I am doing it. The hand is only an instrument. If there is any giving, I am doing it. The hand is only an instrument. If there's any withholding, I am doing it. The hand is only an instrument. And so it is that to say that this hand is honest or dishonest is foolishness. To say that this hand is good or bad is foolishness. This hand is dead. It is a dead lump of meat. And it has no powers of any kind. All the power that this hand can ever show forth is that which I am. I determine the nature of the activity of this hand. You can go from your head to your foot and you will realize that this is the same truth of your entire body. Your body isn't good or bad, it isn't moral or immoral. Your body is neither well nor sick. If there are any such things, acknowledge it. I am. What I entertain in my consciousness, I am showing forth in my body. There is nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so. This is not a confirmation of the New Thought teaching of uh, negative thinking and constructive thinking and that you are the product of your thoughts. Oh no, we in no wise agree with that New Thought teaching. The 
universal belief is uh, what we are entertaining. And so it is that your wrong thinking is not responsible for your ills, nor is your right thinking responsible for good in your experience. Regardless of how many books have been written to the contrary, it isn't true. There is a universal belief which we, th which we through just being born, accept. For instance, sitting in a draft will give you a cold. Now that's not your wrong thinking. That's a universal medical belief. Germs carry disease. That's not your wrong thinking. That's just another universal medical belief. Uh, it's not true that sitting in a draft gives you a cold. It's not true that germs carry disease. But as long as they are accepted as authoritative universal beliefs, they will act as law in the human mind and you will be a victim of it unless and until you come out, separate yourself from such, and uh, through spiritual understanding declare the universal mortal beliefs of mankind uh, shall not operate in me as law since I have come under the Christian instruction of grace. I live not by law, but by grace. The law shall not encompass my being. I have come out from under the law of Moses into the grace revealed by Christ Jesus. Now, if you persist in this, one by one the so-called laws of mankind will fail to function in your experience. In the same way, those of you who are acquainted with metaphysical and spiritual practitioners undoubtedly know that they go into homes where there are all manner of diseases, infections, contagions, and so forth, and yet never take away with them any of those diseases. And yet they do not indulge the medical practice of washing themselves in acids and so forth and so on. In the same way, every metaphysical or spiritual practitioner is called upon to heal all manner of disease regardless of the name or nature of it. And every healing is a nullification of the universal material law of that disease. Every time tuberculosis has been healed, it has proven that germs are not power. Every time that pneumonia has been healed or typhoid fever has been healed spiritually, metaphysically, it is proof that the law had no power. Every time that a person has swallowed poison, either intentionally or unintentionally, and had a spiritual healing, it is proof that the poison isn't power. Every time that a lame man has walked, it is proof that the powers of locomotion aren't in muscles, and that the laws governing such are not laws. Every time a spiritual or metaphysical healing has taken place, it has been proof positive that the law governing the disease wasn't a law. Now you see, it wasn't the wrong thinking of you or of me that brought that disease. It wasn't at all. It was a universal law of which we were victims. Some of us are victims of sin. Others are victims of disease. Others are victims of poverty. That isn't our wrong thinking. It is the universal wrong uh, thinking which victimizes us until we learn that grace supersedes law. Now when you can accept 
a power of grace. You will nullify the laws that are binding you, whether they are laws of sin, of disease, of lack. You nullify them when you can accept the power of grace. You will also see this. The good or evil isn't in the condition, it isn't in the thing. You know how many people there are in this world, how many millions of people struggling for wealth. And you know that there's no power in that wealth. Some people have gotten it and then couldn't eat a meal. Other people have gotten it and drank themselves to death. Wealth is no guarantee of any good power, of course neither is poverty. Nothing in this world is power. Nothing can give you contentment. Nothing can give you satisfaction unless it comes as an added thing through the power of grace. First, recognize this. Some of the very things that are considered good today were once considered evil. Some of the things that we call evil today were once thought of, and in some places may still be thought of, as good. The good isn't in the thing, in the condition, or in the person. Good is in our acceptance of those things. If I see that the animating influence of my life is Christ. Now I'm speaking in the same manner as Paul saying I can do all things through Christ or I live yet not I, Christ liveth my life. If I once adopt as a principle of life or if I once catch the vision that there is a spiritual part of me, a spiritual instinct in me, the Spirit of God, the presence of God, the life of God, and then make myself subject unto it. It becomes the law of my being and of my body and of my business and of my harmonies. Therefore, I am the determining factor by acknowledging him whom to know aright is life eternal. When, however, I accept some things as good and some things as evil, then I make myself subject unto them. Choose this day whom you will serve. There is a moment of transition in the life of every truth student when the student must acknowledge that God is one. Now this moment comes to everyone sooner or later. You will find that very few truth students at the present time agree that God is one. They may agree that the Bible says so, but they haven't accepted that because they have accepted two powers. And you can't accuse God of being both good and evil. So if you have a power of evil, if you have an evil condition to be set aside, if you have an evil person to overcome, you have not accepted God as one. You've merely accepted God in the Hebraic sense as a great, great almighty power but uh, only mighty over other powers. Always there will be David and Goliath in your experience. Two powers. And the power of good will overcome the power of evil. Now in the spiritual path of Jesus Christ, there is no such thing as David and Goliath. There is no such thing as good overcoming evil. The Master, Christ Jesus, stood before Pilate 
the greatest temporal power of his day, and said, Thou couldst have no power over me unless it were given thee of the Father. And he walked up to a leper and touched him, indicating clearly that leprosy had no power. To another he said, What did hinder you? Well, what did hinder you? The man was crippled. And yet he said, What did hinder you? In other words, being crippled isn't a power. Rise, pick up your bed, and walk. And uh, to sinners, he said, neither do I condemn thee. He gave no power to sin, no power to disease, certainly no power to lack, for in the face of the appearance of lack, he always overcame that. And not with a power, oh no, no, when he was in hunger and he was tempted to use power to feed himself, he said, oh no, get thee behind me, Satan. No, we're not going to have two powers here, me with a good one and lack with a bad one. No, we'll have just one power and nothing to be overcome, just the grace of God to be shown forth. Now, when you individually stand up, sit, ponder, and accept within yourself there are no powers of evil. There is no such thing as good over evil, God over devil, immortal over mortal. There is only one presence and one power, and you stand in that rigidly. In spite of all appearances, you stand in it. I refuse to be moved. Get thee behind me, Satan. There'll be no display of power here, not even of God power. We need no power, for there is nothing to be overcome, nothing to be destroyed, nothing to be removed. God is, therefore I am. God is. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. No turning to God and praying for anything. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. That's all. No using thoughts to overcome lack or limitation. No using thoughts to overcome sin or disease. Who, by taking thought, can add to a statue one cubit? Who, by taking thought, can make a white hair black? If ye then, by taking thought, cannot do the least of these things, why believe that you can do the mighty ones? Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. By my very presence, good is. Not using a power, no. The thing that got us into the trouble of mortality is the belief in good and evil. You can read it in the story of Adam and Eve. That's what got us into trouble the belief in good and evil. Where there is a belief of good and evil, you're in trouble because you're looking for a power of good to overcome the evil, and there isn't any. There isn't any. There's no overcoming power. No provision was made in God's universe for overcoming any powers. The Master said, I have overcome the world. Ah, uh, yes, that's a different overcoming. To him that overcometh shall be given the whole world. But overcometh what? The belief in two powers, good and evil. That is uh, the entrance into mortality, the belief in good and evil. Overcome that by the realization that there can't be God, an infinite good and evil too, and then stand in that realization of one, not trying to use God, but submitting and surrendering ourselves to God in the realization that God in the midst of me is mighty, and then letting that power use our mind, 
our soul, our body, our being, our talent, letting it, surrendering ourselves to it. Now you will find this. <clears throat> the question that we have tonight is, what is the true function of the five physical senses? You might also add to that, what is the true function of the mind? God is a spirit. In fact, God is a spirit, the only spirit, the one. Our mind is an instrument through which God functions, and our body is the functioning of the mind. Instead of taking thought, using thought, trying to think thoughts, watch the miracle that comes into your life when you open your mind for an inflow from uh, the spirit and then see what kind of a mind you have and see whether it is ever filled with evil thoughts, negative thoughts, limiting thoughts, critical thoughts, condemnatory thoughts, you'll find it isn't. The only time those things enter are when uh, you are shutting yourself off temporarily from the inflow. To make this clearer to you, take the attitude that you are a composer of music. And you're about your business of composing. But you don't want to uh, plagiarize the music that has already come into uh, expression through others. You certainly realize the limitlessness of God, of divine inspiration. And so you make yourself comfortable Find yourself at peace, get quiet inside, and let inspiration flow. And uh, if you are truly of an inspirational nature, if you really are a composer, you will find uh, that music will begin to reveal itself to you within you and then you will write it down on paper. Now, that which we call God or your soul is the source of that music. Your mind is the instrument through which it comes and your hand is the instrument through which it's written or played. Or your voice is the instrument through which it's sung. If you are a painter, sculptor, same thing. Regardless of what you want to bring forth, you want to bring it forth not as others have done before you, but in an original way. <clears throat> Artists don't make great reputations just copying other people's work. It should be inspirational. It should be original. And so, having developed your skills and techniques through the medium of the mind, remember, Again, you quiet yourself. Each one works differently. Some prefer to go out into the outdoors and some to remain indoors. Some like the inspiration of a church or a temple. But the main thing is attaining peace, an inner peace and an inner quiet. And sooner or later, inspiration flows and forth comes a different idea or a new idea or an old idea with a different technique. And again, the mind is the instrument through which it is interpreted and the hands are the instrument through which it is made manifest. Now this applies to any form of our daily life. 
business, government, art, literature, music, any phase of our lives can be made sacred and spiritual by opening ourselves within to an inflow from the source. The source is God. And our mind is the interpreter of that which comes to us, and our hand fashions. So it is. The five physical senses are extensions of consciousness. There is only one real sense, one real consciousness. I can be conscious of you through seeing you. I can be conscious of you through hearing you. I can be conscious of you through tasting, touching, smelling. But you see, it's only being conscious. Therefore, there's really only one activity, and that's consciousness. But again, the five senses are extensions of consciousness, each one functioning in a different way, just as hands function one way, feet another way, or the right hand one way and the left hand another way, each complementing the other and forming the completeness. Every part of us is an extension of consciousness, and consciousness is functioning through our minds and through our bodies. Consciousness is God. Therefore, God is functioning through our minds and bodies if, if we do not accept the human limitation of good and evil, of trying to create with the mind. Just think if our great inventors were trying to create with their minds. The only thing they could create is that which was already known to their minds. How could anyone have conceived then of these great inventions heretofore unknown unless there was a source greater than the human mind? Ah, yes, do you not see that anyone can write books just by studying books on the subject in the library and then twisting the words around a little bit and have an original book? But that is not true authorship. True authorship is when the mind is open and a divine idea, a new idea, a new plot, a new story, a new something comes through that the world heretofore has not known of. So must it be with every activity of our life. We can a divine idea, a new idea, a new plot, a new story, a new something comes through that the world heretofore has not known of. So must it be with every activity of our life. We can run our homes through inspiration and run them in ways that were never known in Mother's Day. They are being run that way. I often wonder what my mother would think of our kitchens today. <laughs> yes, something new has come into the world in that direction, and uh, it's something completely unknown to the mind when it evolved. It was an inspiration that appeared, and so it is. In every factor of our experience, we can open ourselves to the infinite source of our being, and our lives will be lived infinitely, spiritually, harmoniously, perfectly. If we try to live our lives ourselves from what we have read in books, from what our parents lived or our grandparents. If we merely try to follow their customs, become inhibited with their beliefs, well, you know what happens. We crystallize. It is only when those of daring open their vision to something that is beyond human knowledge that we begin to uh, function from a spiritual basis. Some, quite some years ago, <clears throat> this opened a thought in my mind, and I wondered 
where, where was the idea of a government like the United States government, where was that ever originated? Where was it ever thought of? How was it ever uh, planned when at that particular time there was no model for it? All we had then was the governments of Europe. And uh, certainly at that time, none of them was anything like the pattern that came out of the Revolutionary War, the pattern that came out with the Constitution. And uh, there was no way to find where these things happened or how, because our history books don't have them in the States. There's no way of learning those things. And it was by going back into this spirit that I was led to a thread. And following that thread, I found a whole rope. And you know, it led back here to England, to Francis Bacon. And there I found that the entire model for the Constitution of the United States had been written in this country and had been sent to the colonies before they were even colonies. Now, somewhere in that man's consciousness was an idea of a state, a government, that was to function on lines as it eventually came through with citizens of all one level of uh, equality in voting and so forth, but with provisions for those of uh, adequate preparation and knowledge to be governing bodies, and not an individual, but groups, as was afterward formed in uh, Congress and so forth and so on. Now, of course we're told that all of these ideas originated with the signers of the Constitution, but you know that no such important a thing could evolve in a few weeks' time as that which evolved. And so we find that it went back a hundred years before then and was evolving in and through the consciousness of one individual. And from that one, through small groups placed in different spots in the colonies, until it became a living reality as a government. Now, so it is with everything. Invention, ideas of government, ideas of world government, ideas of commerce, all of these, you may be assured, exist now in their completeness in what we call God consciousness. But remember that God consciousness is your and my individual consciousness. Therefore, you and I can by practice go back into our own consciousness and find infinity in any direction. If we are inventors, we can go back into that consciousness and find inventions not yet known to man. If uh, there are ideas of art, literature, government, go back into your consciousness and let that consciousness express itself. And you will find uh, books that have never been written, ideas that have never been known, and it all lies within individual you and me. Therein is uh, the greatest blessing of Christianity. It alone makes the individual king. The kingdom of God is within you. I and my Father are one. Call no man on earth your father. One is your father, God. One consciousness is your consciousness, God. One life is your life, God. 
reach back and let it unfold and disclose and reveal itself and it will live its life as your life and infinity will be the measure of your demonstration Paul says I have not yet achieved that but forgetting those limitations which are behind I'm pressing toward the mark of that high calling the stature of manhood in Christ Jesus never forget that no one may claim yet to be omniscience yet everyone may claim omniscience to be the measure of their mind and soul and spirit and body and everyone may reach back into that omniscience which is their individual being and let it flow and it will come forth in the measure of your understanding of today tomorrow it will come forth in greater measure next year in still greater measure there will never be a limit to the unfolding consciousness which you are when you go back behind the reasoning thinking mind now that doesn't mean to exterminate the mind please remember that it doesn't mean to deny it or to wipe it out it means to let it be what it was intended to be a function through which the spirit reveals itself to you the spirit is God infinite omnipotent omniscient omnipresent and uh, by the attitude of receptivity speak Lord thy servant heareth you open yourself to that flow and as you do that flow comes into your life as youth strength vitality ideas health sufficiency you see <clears throat> thy grace is my sufficiency in all things thy grace not having one power to do something to another power acknowledge thy grace as the one power and the only power and let that one power be don't try to use the power of truth you won't succeed and you delay your progress let the power of truth use you let the power in the presence of God use you be an instrument remember this we call Christ Jesus master but he was a servant he served everybody this from disciples to multitudes he served them all he held himself as a master over no one why callest thou me master why callest thou me good there's but one good the father in heaven if I speak of myself I bear witness to a lie my power is not mine oh no the father within me he doeth the works and I'm but an instrument through which that divine power flows certainly you can't separate the divine power from its instrument but you can recognize the divine power as the source and the instrument as the effect and let them be one for they are one your meditations serve to demonstrate this way of life for you because it is in your in your meditation that you are saying figuratively speaking I am my own self am nothing and can do nothing speak Lord thy servant heareth and you be receptive and let divine wisdom flow only in your meditations can you develop 
this sense of being used, of being an instrument through which God flows. And only in your meditation can you resist the temptation to believe in two powers. Only in your meditation can you let go and rest and realize, thank you, Father. Nothing to heal, nothing to overcome, nobody to reform, just to rest in thee, rest in thy grace. Thy grace is my sufficiency. No longer under the law of good and evil, no longer under the law of strong and weak, no longer under the law of threescore years and ten, no longer under the laws of calendars, men's beliefs that change year by year, subject only unto thy grace. And that feeling comes in of one presence, of one power, not of a world to be fought or destroyed or to be overcome. The atmosphere of this room is beautiful. Now, where does the atmosphere of this room end? At the walls? Wouldn't that be a terrible sense of limitation to feel that all of God's peace was locked up in this room? No, if there is peace in this room, then peace exists wherever it is realized. The people who were here before may have had a war among themselves, and the people who come next may have a war among themselves. So the peace isn't in this room. The peace is in the consciousness of those who are in this room. Therefore, peace is wherever it is realized. And wherever it is realized that there are not two powers, peace is realized. You can only be at peace when you have come to the realization that there are not two powers. Why do not the nations of the world do away with their armaments in this minute? Because they believe in two powers. Because they are under the universal belief in two powers. And so they have to go into their meetings loaded with bombs we come into these meetings loaded with love, but we're the same people that they are, only they lack the wisdom to know that there is only one power. There's no difference between us and our fellow men and women out in the world. They couldn't experience the peace that we are experiencing in this, experiencing in this room. They couldn't because they are accepting fear. They're accepting two powers, and they're fearing one of them, and uh, hoping that there's another good one that's better than the bad one. Not very confident of it. Not very confident because they want a little bit more of the bad power than the other fellow has. Not much confidence in the good power. And frankly, no one will ever find peace while they believe that there is a God who is a power over something, for there isn't. God is God itself, and God is a power of peace to all those who accept it, but the peace consists of knowing that there are no other powers. Peace consists of knowing that God alone is power. That wipes out fear, you see, of germs, infection, contagion, bullets, bombs and uh, the evil schemes of men. Men can plot and scheme and do harm as long as there is a world believing in the power to do so. <coughs> Perhaps you don't know <clears throat> this, but it has been said that there's only one reason we are ever robbed or defrauded or cheated and the reason is that we have a little losity in us. The person who is completely pure, completely pure, 
we are told, is never robbed or wronged or cheated or defrauded. You might uh, investigate that a little, see whether you find evidences of that. But it's true, it is true, what we hold in our consciousness is that which we meet in our daily experience. There's nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so. And if we can be made to accept the beliefs of the world, we suffer by it. Now, you cut. <clears throat>